Good morning, and welcome to Hoover. I know it's been a long week. Um, there's always an issue about whether you should back cleanup or last or first in these sorts of things. But what I'd like to do today is share with you my perspectives on the future economy you're going to inherit as you move through your working life, as you finish school, move through your working life, have children, and eventually, I know it's a long way off for you, head toward retirement. What are the kinds of things that are going to really affect the economy and how it performs? Uh, I'm going to stall for a few minutes because they're working on getting the slides up on the screen. They'll send me a signal when, uh, when it's ready. And uh, this, the reason for doing this talk is that in recent years, for the first time um, since the Great Depression, in polls, a sizable majority of Americans have said they think that their children will not be as well off as they have been, their children and grandchildren. That's a startling change uh, over the course of several generations. That concern about the future, that concern about the distant future, even if not matched by pressure on our political institutions to uh, exact policies or implement policies that will uh, improve that trade-off, that, that future income of future generations, of future working generations, um, is to me one of the most startling things about contemporary uh, political economy. And in my view, it is no small part of the reason why, in country after country, we see uh, a tremendous pressure to upset, turn over, get rid of, replace the existing political economy, the existing, po existing politics, and economic order. And whether that's Catalonia threatening, trying to secede from Spain, Brexit, where the British are exiting under very un a cloud of very unclear potential terms, the European Union, whether that's the election of Donald Trump here and the rise of, uh, very rapid rise of social network and lower level organized political movements in many countries around the world, particularly in Europe and Central and Eastern Europe in particular, uh, that have see seek to try to change the economic institutions uh, as basic as the European Union, free trade agreements, the tax code, regulatory apparatus, government oversight, and the relationship of central governments, in our case, the government in Washington, to subnational, in our case, states and localities, in Europe's case, sometimes counties or provinces, the equivalent of states, and supranational institutions, such as the European Union and uh, supranational regional and global trade agreements that have on balance been uh, a boon to the economy over very long periods of time, and especially to the geopolitical stability of the global economic commons. So this is, to me, a startling development and one worthy of focus and one that gets too little focus. Almost all the attention in recent years, uh, perhaps uh, understandably given the severity of the Great Recession, the worst downturn in a generation, the financial crisis, the anemic economic recovery we'll talk about in a moment, which was, at, for the first few years, at half speed of what might, one might expect from a deep recession. All those things are contributing to a longer-term pessimism and a focus on very short-term economic policies, on policies that may have temporarily alleviated some hardship, but not much attention was paid to the long-run cost of a greatly expanded uh, generalized welfare system and the need to titrate the people who are able, willing and able to get work uh, to move back into the labor force rather than to stay on government dependency. So all these things are upsetting our polity and a new political reality has been emerging. How long it will last, whether we revert to the previous political reality some years in the future, or whether this is uh, going to be the, the lay of the land for some time to come, remains to be seen. So when I think about what, e what the economy will look like that you will inherit, I tend to ask seven basic questions. I'll try to do this all from memory since the slides aren't quite ready yet. So first, why did we have such a slow recovery from this deep recession? 
what was, the, what was that the cause of? Is this a new structural reality, something called secular stagnation by my former student Larry Summers um, and others? Are we doomed to have very low growth other than an occasional quick blip up? With all the extraordinary measures, the Federal Reserve expanding its balance sheets to, to four trillion, cutting interest rates to zero, and the fiscal uh, accommodation, quote, stimulus, unquote, is a question how much it actually helped the economy. But the large amount of fiscal response to the economic downturn. And all we could get was a paltry economic recovery. In recoveries from previous deep recessions, the economy grew four or five percent for several, several years in the early phases of the recovery. That was true in the economic downturn of 1981-82, when the unemployment rate actually was higher than its worst in the Great Recession. The unemployment rate peaked at 10.8% in 19, uh, early 1983. And the worst it was in the Great Recession was 10%. Horrible, but it's not like we never had a deep recession before, but we grew strongly out of it because we had a better set of fiscal uh, policies and monetary policies to boot. From the other deep post-World War II recession in the mid-1970s, we grew not quite that fast, but roughly double what we grew uh, the 2% recovery uh, in the, just to use this for historical reference, sometimes now called the Obama recovery. Presidents like quarterbacks probably get too much credit and too much blame for how the economy does. Many things affect the economy that have nothing to do with decisions in Washington. Presidents inherit for good or ill what their predecessors have left them. The president has a Congress that is heavily involved in the making of tax and regulation policy. So it's not all the blame or credit if the economy does poorly or well to be attached to the president. So the first is, was this deep recession and anemic recovery due to a permanent structural problem? Are we almost back to full employment or at or even beyond full employment? We start, we're starting to see inflation increase a little bit. So let's take a quick look at this. The shaded areas are recession periods, and this goes back several decades. And if you look at the, at the graph from left to right, you'll see something very noticeable, that the, recent, the, the green arrows, that is the economic recovery, the, the quarterly growth rates and annual growth rates from uh, the deepest uh, uh, great depths of the Great Recession, have slowed from the analogous periods prior to this. So if we look at, well, that's, if we look at these, this recovery and this recovery, we see very strong early signs. And here we see this is generally heading down. Is, that a, is there a permanent structural explanation for that? The economic outlook right now is for about 3% growth right now. And 2.6 or 7% next year from most of the leading forecasting firms, well above, even though we're more or less back to full employment, well above what was done prior to that in the last few years. So even though there was more room to expand earlier because we had so much underutilized labor and to some extent underutilized capital, uh, as that has gotten used up, generally we get back to the limit of the economy's growth, and the economy seems to be doing better than that. So maybe some policy changes have helped. If we look at inflation and unemployment, we also see in the early years of, uh, uh, of the period that inflation kept rising at the corresponding point of the business cycle, just at the peak of the cycle, just before the recession. And then we got the tremendous disinflation in the early Reagan years. And of course, the unemployment rate zoomed started to decline, and you can see decline rapidly. 
Here the unemployment rate declined, but, uh, but pretty slowly. Uh, the inflation rate has got down eventually to roughly the Fed's target level of around 2% and has crept, started to creep up. And a big question confronting the Federal Reserve is if we're at full employment, are we really about to see uh, some non-trivial increase in inflation, in which case an even stronger increase in interest rates would be uh, desirable? We'll come back to that in a few minutes. As the unemployment rate has come down, however, the share of the population working, the employment ratio, which is the number of people employed over the working age population, the unemployment rate is the number of people who do not have a job who've been looking for one recently over the labor force. So the difference here is that there's still a lot of people on the sidelines, not nearly as many as three or four years ago, but there are a lot of people on the sidelines who have not yet moved back into the labor force. The labor force participation rate has declined. And we see here the Fed had, the red bar is the nominal interest rate, had the interest, whoops, had the interest rate, whoops, had the interest rate roughly at zero, but when we adjust for inflation, the real interest rate has been negative and it's just getting back to zero. The real interest rate, the nominal interest rate, minus the inflation rate. So all this period, you could borrow money at very trivial interest rates and pay it back with, uh, with inflated dollars. So if you borrowed a dollar, you could pay it back a year, two years, three years later with 98 cent dollars or 96 cent dollars. So there was tremendous monetary stimulus. The Fed, as I said, built up its balance sheet tremendously. And this is the budget, federal budget receipts and outlays. The difference between the green and blue bars is the deficit. And what do we see? A yawning, immense deficit closing, and now it's starting to rise again. Well, what can we say about the deficit? First of all, a deficit naturally expands, or a surplus disappears and turns into a deficit when the economy heads into a deep recession, because that causes uh, revenues to the federal government to fall even more rapidly than income because of our progressive income tax. And outlays rise automatically. There's an automatic expansion of unemployment insurance. And then there's generally the Congress voting to make them more generous and extend even over a longer period. So we have to divide this between the automatic stabilizers, the response that's built into the system that occurs even if no policy change is made, and the effect of economic policy. And President Obama was fond of saying that his deficits were mainly caused by the recession. And he certainly inherited the recession. He didn't create it. He got stuck with it. He had some responses uh, that I think didn't work out so well, but uh, that, save that for another story. Um, and, well, that is not, the slide is not on here. So it turns out that if you adjust for the business cycle, which the Congressional Budget Office does in a publication, and ask what net of the automatic stabilizers, how big was the deficit? So this is the kind of the policy aspect of deficits. It turned out President Obama had the largest cyclically adjusted budget deficit of any president since World War II. So big, big changes under Obama. And in my view, they didn't pay off very well. Uh, but now we see moving forward, the federal budget deficit keeps rising for some time, for about the next decade, and we're talking about trillion dollar deficits for the uh, first time since the early days of the Great Recession. Uh, so a large budget deficit at a time when the economy is close to full employment is highly unusual. If we project out what the debt is, the blue line is the Congressional Budget Office extended baseline, the red bar is their alternative fiscal scenario, uh, which suggests that, there were, uh, that some of the tax hikes that are due to expire will be extended, that we won't be quite as severe on our spending uh, restraint, that is lowering growth rates, not actually cutting spending, but slowing it from projected levels, will not be quite as severe. We see that it quickly gets into uncharted territory. Uh, we'll come back to the 
implications of that in a moment. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's the chart I was looking for. This shows that Obama had the largest uh, cyclically adjusted budget deficits. Okay, so what do we make from all that? An immense policy response, the economy didn't do very well. Would it have done much worse? I do believe that the early responses of the Fed were necessary and helped things uh, stabilize after a large drop. And I think it's still unclear whether a well-designed fiscal response, once the Fed has gotten interest rates down to zero, will work. But it was highly politicized and, in my view, pretty darn ineffective. So the second question, so I come to the conclusion that the economy is capable of doing better than that miserable growth rate. I don't think we'll continue to grow at 4% as we did last quarter, but I think the economy is capable of doing considerably better with much better policies, a lighter hand of government, we'll come to taxes in a moment, a lighter hand in regulation, a more stable monetary policy. I think the Fed's under Chairman Powell is off to a good start. But now if we think about the longer term, the single biggest issue will be whether productivity enhancing technology gains are weakening. That is, we see productivity slowing down and we see lots, an explosion of stuff, internet-related stuff, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, various types of biotechnology. We see uh, all this cloud computing. We see the internet of things. We see lots of things going on that some people are getting rich doing and that help in some dimensions, but they seem thus far at least not to have been as enhancing of the broad base of the labor force's productivity as earlier inventions such as the automobile or the steam, let alone the steam engine or electricity and things of this sort. So whether the killer apps for productivity rather than for fun on your uh, cell phone are really, really out there and will have the same transformative effect remains to be seen. In a, the last time we had something like this, in the early days of the spread of personal com computing and then personal computers, the great MIT Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Solow said that computers are everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And it turned out with a lag, maybe it just takes time for people to figure out what will actually help, and it kind of works its way through over after a decade or two of use, but over time they actually did imp expand productivity. So this remains to be seen. It's also true that if we look at the history of technology, many, many inventions didn't pay off for a while, and they paid off for the broad economy in a way that had little or nothing to do with what it was that they were invented for. James Watt's steam engine was designed to lift water out of coal mines. He never envisioned steam locomotion or steamships. Marconi's first transatlantic wireless transmission was designed to compete with the telegraph and point-to-point -point communication. He never envisioned radio or that smartphone you have, which among other things is a radio. And the most famous American inventor, Thomas Edison, legend has it, this is not readily confirmable, but there's a, a, a myth about this that may well be true, and if not, it's a great story anyway. invented the phonograph to help blind people and never and actually allegedly sued to prevent it from being used for music. So I have some cautious optimism that all this money going into all these things and people using them will eventually lead to measurable productivity gains in the workplace, not just in our personal leisure time. But that's a big open question and probably the most important one. Because long-term economic growth is driven by the contribution of output per worker hour, productivity, how rapidly that grows, and the number of worker hours, how fast the labor force grows or shrinks or whatever it does. And so the things we can do to enhance productivity in our typical economic models include greater skills of the labor force, more and better investment in productivity-enhancing capital, whether that's computers or uh, 
rolling stock or fracking, whatever it happens to be. Okay. And those things are affected by economic policy. They're affected by tax policy, by regulatory policy, and the like. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. So this is what's happened to productivity. It's been declining. 